So last week, we began exploring Celtic spirituality by focusing on the concept of the goodness of creation. This meant that not only during the time of Adam and Eve, that that was good, but that everything created since that time is also inherently good. That God created everything good, that no power on earth or in heaven can completely take that goodness away from us. God's love, God's goodness is stronger than anything else. We learned about Pelagius who looked for the good in all people and in all things and taught that we can begin to listen for the heartbeat of God as we listen for the beating of our own heart and spirit. Today in our journey, we will examine some of the ideas of other Celtic leaders like St. Patrick and St. Bridget. It's in the early Irish mission of Patrick that we see a fuller emergence of some of the main distinguishing ideas and features of Celtic spirituality, including the goodness of creation and a sense of the, the company of heaven being present among us here on earth, that God really is with us and for us, now and always. In the prayers and the art of the church, there is a intertwining of the spiritual and material, heaven and earth, time and eternity. The Celtic church was not afraid to reach out and grasp the strength of God and to seek the energies of the elements of creation to be present with them, to protect them, to strengthen them, and to guide them. Life for them is not some isolated event lived without connection to the world around us as well as the world above us. The words of St. Patrick's hymn capture this reality. I bind unto myself today the virtues of the starlit heaven, the glorious sun's life-giving ray, the whiteness of the moon at evening, the flashing of lightning free, the whirling winds, tempestuous shocks, the stable earth, the deep salt sea, even that Mariana trench around the old eternal rocks. We sang a version of that hymn at the beginning of the sermon service known as St. Patrick's Breastplate or the Lorica. Lorica is a Latin word that means breastplate or shield. It's that kind of writing that says this protects me. It's a, a word, a hymn of protection, asking God's presence. Even though it probably actually dates from a later period and was not written by Patrick, its themes reflect the major characteristics of Celtic Christianity. The graces of the elements are invoked in a way that suggests that the spiritual exists within the matter of creation and that God's healing and restoring powers are to be found in the goodness of creation. Just as Pelagius emphasized our essential God-given goodness, so in the tradition of St. Patrick there is an awareness that all created things carry within them the grace and goodness of God, a ways that God can always be with us and for us. The second characteristic that closeness of heaven's company among us on earth comes across especially in the most well-known part of that hymn we sang. Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort and restore me, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger, Christ in hearts of all that love me, Christ in mouth of friend, and stranger. There is not in Celtic spirituality a great gap between earth and heaven. Rather, they are inseparably intertwined. This represents a divergence from the hierarchical level language of the Roman Catholic Church that saw a great divide at the time between earth and heaven. Creature and creator, it's pictured that Sistine Chapel where human and God just reach out but can't quite touch. There's the chasm still between them. In Celtic spirituality, there is no chasm that God is intertwined with all that God has created with our lives. This idea comes forth from 
Christianity growing in the spiritually rich soil of Ireland's people who embraced a Druidic spirituality so closely tied to nature. In the wisdom of the early missionaries to the Celts, like Patrick, the gospel was permitted to work its mystery of transformation in the life and culture of the people. And so the gospel wasn't seen as was seen as fulfilling rather than just destroying the old Celtic mythologies. Instead of them saying, forget everything you ever believed, everything you ever knew, let us tell you how you can know that even more deeply. Understand that even better. Let us give it a name. The strong relationship that the people felt to the creation around them was deepened by their faith in Jesus. The missionaries like Patrick brought a greater depth of meaning to everything the Celtic people had known and held dear. The people found in the Christian faith a freedom to become truly themselves instead of erasing old beliefs and perspectives and practices to follow something totally new. Patrick and others allowed the old Celtic beliefs and practices to inform their Christianity. A 6th century bard claimed that Christ is always been known to the Celts as a teacher, but they had not known him by name. It was in a way a mission modeled on St. Paul's sermon to the Athenians in the book of Acts. Having discovered among them an altar to an unknown God, Paul had told the Athenians, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, to speak of the one in whom we live and move and have our being. What he was saying to the Greeks were, you, you honor this idea of God, this deeper truth and meaning. Let me take that, that desire, that wisdom, that respect, and let me give it a name. Let me show you even more deeply about it so you can grow in it and have it for your own. So this method of mission later became a, a standard of practice in the rest of Europe, and it helped explain why we celebrate Christmas the way we do on the 25th and have Christmas trees, or why Easter is named Easter. Easter has nothing to do with the Bible. It's not some fancy Greek word that means resurrection. Easter is named for Aostra, a pagan fertility goddess. And that's like our biggest holiday, right? So you know how often we're like, we need to keep Christ in Christmas. We didn't even keep Christ in the naming of our biggest holiday. Why, though? Again, it's because instead of trying to have people forget everything, there was some truth in this idea of Aostra, this fertility goddess of life, death, and resurrection. As we talked about last week, if all truth is God's truth, if all goodness is God's goodness, we can take what we learn from all these different things, all the truth we find in that cycle of life, death, and the promise of resurrection, and connect that more deeply to the God who reveals God's self in Jesus Christ. That way, Christians didn't have to say, oh, we're scared of these other religions, we're scared of any other belief that may contradict or may have something similar. No, it was, we honor truth wherever we find it. We honor goodness wherever we find it. Because ultimately, that goodness is God's goodness. Anyone ever read the Chronicles of Narnia? So C.S. Lewis raised uh, in Northern Ireland, a lot of this Celtic spirituality affected him. In the last book of the Chronicles of Narnia, the last battle, spoiler alert, this Callerman soldier meets Aslan face to face. The Callermans worship this other god, this kind of bird-like thing called Tosh. And this soldier had worshipped Tosh all his life, and then he sees Aslan, the great lion, the somewhat Jesus figure in the books, and he realizes, "Uh uh-oh, I've been wrong all my life. He's afraid he's about to get eaten or punished by Aslan because he had always worshipped another god. But Aslan says, All the good you did to Tash, you did unto me. No good thing can be done ultimately in the evil thing's name. No evil thing can be done in a good thing's name. In other words, all the good you did, all the searching for truth and love, what you named Tash, what really you were searching for all your life, what you were doing good for all your life, was really me. And the soldier realizes that and enters into Aslan's kingdom further up and further in. There's always goodness. So the Celtic people 
which had previously embraced this Druidic religion, now embraced this Christian theology and worldview. And their expressed desire to hold together the revelation of God in creation and the revelation of God in the Bible brought them to the practice of listening for the living word of God in nature as well as in the scriptures. So stories of the 6th century Saint Bridget illustrate these unique features of the Celtic church. It was said that Bridget's mother had been baptized by Patrick, and her father had been a Druidic priest. So in legend, therefore, she symbolized this meeting of the gospel with pre-Christian Ireland. Pre-Christian myths about the goddess Bridget were assimilated into Celtic church stories about the 6th century Saint Bridget, often with scant regard for historical congruity. There are similar legends about other saints like St. Nicholas and even church leaders like Martin Luther. They often become larger than life to speak stories that still share goodness and truth. We do know that Bridget was the 6th century abbess of Kildare. Kildare means Church of the Oaks. Derry means Oak Grove or Oak Forest. Oak groves had been sacred places for the Druids. It's typical of the Celtic church not to have destroyed or ignored the ancient oak groves, but to have transformed them into centers of its mission. The Irish came to revere Bridget as their patron, or rather mother saint, second only to Patrick. Many of the stories about these saints associate them with the belief of the intrinsic goodness of creation. For instance, Bridget is said to have used herbal remedies pointing to the belief that God's restorative graces are found in nature. Often the medicine we need comes from the natural world. It can be found here, whether it's penicillin, or if you have a sore throat, you just need some tea and some honey, and that'll do you. Iona was probably another sacred Druid site that became a sacred Christian site when Columbus set up his community there. We'll learn more about Columba and that journey on the Sunday after Easter. But missionaries left Iona, spread the gospel throughout Scotland and Ireland. Columba actually started in Derry, Ireland, before going to Iona. And even after the Synod of Whitby, which kind of chose to go with the Roman, the Catholic-style church over the Celtic church, the monastery of Iona thrived and was a center of resistance to that Roman style of spirituality. This period of resistance on Iona was marked by an artistic creativity that reflected the continuing vitality of the Celtic church's spiritual life. Some of its more beautifully illuminated manuscripts of the Gospels were produced over these centuries. It's likely that the monks of Iona started the work on the Book of Kells around the year 800. So here's a couple images of the Book of Kells, and for those who are going on our heritage trip, you will get to see one page of it when you go into the little special room, but you'll see other images around. So the Celtic combination of the love of creation on the one hand and the love of Scripture on the other is expressed in the brilliantly colored pictures you see, the superbly crafted illuminations of the gospel text. Heaven and earth, the visible and the invisible, are depicted as intertwined, angel faces peeking out at the end of one strand of design, plants or animals or human faces appearing at the end of the next. Celtic art's everlasting pattern, as it's come to be known, that intricate knotwork seen on so many Celtic crosses was used to suggest the internal interweaving of heaven and earth, time and eternity, the immediacy of God in all created life. Everything is tied together. So you also have these kind of Celtic cross images. These are on Iona, St. Martin and St. John's cross. They often have that interlocked pattern, but some of the other famous ones have images of nature or the Bible kind of spread out through all of it. So you see that kind of circle. That's one of the famous pieces of a Celtic cross. So we like to think of the orb at the center. You can kind of see that center part likely represents the sun and the light of the world, and there are scripture and nature images carved on opposite sides together. When you go to Iona, you'll see these. Some of the best Celtic high crosses are just in a little place north of Dublin. Maybe we'll get to see them, but it's filled with all these intricate designs of scripture stories and nature. They reflect the practice of listening for the living word of God in nature as well as in the scriptures. 
That was the conviction of the 9th century Irish philosopher John Scotus Eurigena, whose name means John, the Irishman, from Ireland, just so you're not confused. He taught that Christ moves among us in two shoes, as it were, one shoe being that of creation, the other that of the scriptures. And he stressed the need to be alert and attentive to Christ moving among us in creation as we are to the voice of Christ in scripture, to not disregard one in favor of the other. As with the leaders of the Celtic church who preceded him, John believed the light of God was at the heart of every person. But he also believed that sin covered up that light so sometimes it could not be seen by us. And so the grace of God revealed in Jesus Christ is the gift of God that heals our inner sight and allows our eyes to be open once again to the goodness that is deep within us. The grace of Christ restores us to our original simplicity. It's kind of like when you have a computer or a phone and it gets all those viruses and it just doesn't work anymore. What do you have to do? You wipe it and restore manufacturer's original stuff, right? That's kind of how it is with us. We get messed up by sin, and Christ, through his grace, restores us to the original manufacturer settings, how we're divine to be. So John Scott has believed that everything is that is divided will be reunited, whether the division be between heaven and earth, male and female, visible or invisible. He believed that God will reconcile all of creation to itself and to God. Nature on its own cannot tell the full glories of God or God's radical message of love and reconciliation. But if we listen, we can hear echoes of the gospel and see the fingerprints of God. We are not only stewards of creation, but students of creation, partners with creation. So your challenge this week, last week it was to look for goodness in a place you typically don't expect to find it, you don't think is there. This week is to listen within creation. Sit among the flowers that are beginning to pop up. Walk among the trees. Gaze upon the stars. And read and meditate on Scripture while you do. I think you may find a greater appreciation of both in the process. Let us pray together. God, thank you. You are a God with us and for us. A God who surrounds us. It's not some far-off, distant God that we cannot approach who we just reach out for in a vain attempt to come close to. But you are a God who comes close to us in nature, in our own hearts of the Spirit, that your life and your goodness is intertwined with ours. Lord, thank you that you never leave us and that your goodness and your love are everywhere, surrounding us, upholding us, strengthening us, and guiding us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.